should hopefully be okay. Caribou roast and a bed of veggies, expensive French wine. That's our supper for tonight. Cooking for a dozen bottomless appetites, Jack prepares a delicious midweek dinner of wild caribou roast with all the fixings. What I do, I brown it in a pan, then I smear it in mustard, instant coffee on it, 400 degrees for half an hour, and then uh, 350 for about two. And uh, this one came out okay. The resulting feast is highly anticipated by hungry anglers who burn calories by the thousands, fishing for 10 or more hours a day in the Arctic cold. Bon appetit, gentlemen. I think this is excellent food. I think that I come here for the food, not for the fishing. I come here just this delicious caribou. Is it caribou? Yes, caribou is actually better than my wife's. <laughs> well, she's a much better looking cook than <laughs> The humor is high, but the morale is sinking. Compared to previous years, the fishing has been very slow, and commercial nets at the mouth of the river have everyone concerned. An evening round table ensues. So when these fish are coming in, even though the nets are only on one side, one coast, it does impact them, I think, coming down the shoreline here. When the nets were here very close to, in the bottom of the river, the mouth of the river last mm -hmm. year, it did. I mean, it, there was no question. The fish were spooky. It just, well, it just they, shut it down. Yeah, it too. shut it down. And always the nets have been above us. And so that doesn't affect us. Um, and so the fish pass us and then the commercial guys will take what they needed and obviously they do it well because the, the, the fish run is very healthy here. So it's worked very, very well. Last year was different. The nets were right underneath us in the river and so the fish that managed to get through were spooked. My take on it is, is simply this, that if you have nets in that are beneath the fishermen, obviously there has to be an effect. It's a, it's a question of math. You can't take out 4,500 fish without affecting the fishing above where the nets are. And so the problem is that the sports fishermen and the commercial fishermen are fishing at the same time. It's not a problem if the nets are above the sports fishermen. It's a problem if the nets are down below. We've seen a great number of char in the river over the past few days, but the bite has been way off. Strange as it may seem, for the past 10 years, anglers have only fished the campsite of the river. Dave asked Peter Harrison what the fishing is like on the opposite shore. I've never been over the other side. With owner Bill Lyle's son Willie and grandson Fraser looking on, Peter considers the question. But maybe for all of these years, this side is the side where the least fish come in. On that side, my God, we should build a lodge. <laughs> I know two things for sure. Steve and Dave will be on the other side of the river first thing in the morning. And I'm going to pay a visit to the commercial fishing camp below us. I'm on a small island at the mouth of the Ekaluk River, where for two short weeks a year a group of native Inuits set up a commercial fishing camp for Arctic char. I've convinced them to let me come along as they check one of their nets. Historically, this camp has been situated three kilometers upriver at the outflow of Ferguson Lake. For the last two years, however, the commercial fishermen have set their nets at the mouth of the Ekaluk, below Jackson Bill's sport fishing camp. And our group of anglers is convinced it's having a horrible impact on the fishing. Within a few minutes of pulling nets, I can certainly see why they might be worried. But as the day goes on, I begin to think differently. The haul is huge, and for these young commercial fishermen, it's money in the bank. A big fresh fish out of the mouth of the Ekaluk River nets them about $20. By the time it makes its way to the tables of America's gourmet restaurants, a 7-ounce wild Arctic char filet can cost anywhere from $30 to $70 on the menu. And what is wrong with that? Nothing, actually. In fact, from the standpoint of preserving traditional fisheries in an environmentally sustainable manner, it's all quite good. Most char that you find for sale are farm-raised, and in many instances represent everything that is wrong with industrialized aquaculture. 
truly wild architecture have only recently made their way onto the world culinary stage as a premium product produced from an artisan fishery. A movement now being championed by enlightened fishmongers, chefs, and consumers worldwide. Native peoples have been harvesting Akaluk char for centuries. Surely there is room for both a commercial and a sport fishing camp to utilize this rich natural resource. And what effect does responsible harvesting really have on the recreation of fishing anyway? The commercial quota for the Akaluk River Camp was 30,000 pounds this year, or about 4,500 fish. Sure, that might sound and look like a lot of fish being harvested, but it's a small percentage of the entire run that migrates up the Akaluk each fall into 75 mile long Ferguson Lake. During the short season, float planes fly round the clock, transporting char back to the processing plant in Cambridge Bay. While today's catch awaits preparation, yesterday's fish is on the dock, iced down and ready to go. Gotta make a seat for me. Just gonna have a seat on. Uh, on top, you see? In less than an hour, these same red crates of fish will be at the Katikmiot Foods processing plant in Cambridge Bay. There they will go through a final cleaning before being sold as fresh and frozen whole fish, vacuum packed steaks, cold smoked fillets and char jerky. Biological data is collected from a sampling of 200 fish cut on the Ekaluk each year. Fin, scale, and otolith samples are taken to determine the run's average age and health. This is what they used to tell the age of the fish. This information is then used to set sustainable harvest quotas for the future. Commercial fishing is hard work, and once one plane is loaded, a new catch of fish must be cleaned, sorted, and iced for the next intrepid bush pilot, bent on making a large percentage of his annual salary during these few halcyon days of autumn. My fishing buddy Johnny has been extolling the virtues of fresh char liver all morning. I couldn't quite get there. It's only midday, but the guys are getting tired and will soon slip out of their fishing gear for an afternoon nap. The final task is dumping the fish entrails into the mouth of the river, where a healthy population of some of the largest seagulls in the world ensures that the cleanup will be quick. This is what we eat. Nothing goes to waste. We're gonna cook this later on for supper. You cooked the head? Yep. Well, we had the tongue yesterday with uh, some ribs. It was very good. This is what we live on. Ever the gourmand, Johnny invites me back to his shack for a parting taste of native cuisine. Oh yeah, man. Didn't have a whole lot of time to fish myself, but got a chance to catch one of these absolutely spectacular sea run Arctic char. Nice, beautiful fish, I'm gonna let him go. Wow, that